Roxanne's room. She's doing this for Grandma. Hi, Grandma. I love you. Time is of essence. I gotta find my daughter. There are a series of clues to Roxanne Paltov's disappearance that begin to surface for cops. Which kind of, in and of itself, bumps it up a, a level. She has been missing since Friday night. It's now Sunday morning, and still no word from the 18-year-old Austin teen. So from this point on, I don't know what happened to her. But one thing is for sure: Lewis Walls was in no rush to report Roxanne's disappearance to the authorities. Lewis didn't let Roxanne's mom know for quite some time. He didn't report that night that she didn't come back. He didn't report the next morning that she didn't come back. You heard right. Lewis takes a full 24 hours to report his girlfriend missing. As a detective, you know, that's, that's, that's a big alarm for me. Well, he was already at home, had already picked up, supposedly picked up everything from the room and taken it and checked out of the hotel. And by the time cops arrive at the motel? Three days have passed with us not even being aware that someone was missing. It gives time for the hotel to have other tenants in. It's a devastating blow to the investigation, and it was about to get even more complicated. Because of the bookkeeping at the front desk, it was almost impossible to determine exactly what room they were in. So detectives turn their attention to the evidence that does exist. The items Lewis says she left the night she ran off. But first, they need to get them back from Lewis. The fact that all that stuff is left behind is incredibly creepy. And I think one of the other disturbing things about that is, is what Lewis does afterward is he keeps her possessions. Five long days, according to her family. Then finally, Lewis returns them. What did he return and what did you make of what he gave you? He gave back her purse and her cell phone um, and the jewelry that she usually wears, everything, and also a bag of clothes. But when they go through her bag of clothes, there's a big problem. They were not Roxanne's. I know her clothes. You know, I'm her sister. I know every article of clothing that she has. Um, they were not hers. Then detectives make another startling discovery when they pull the missing teen's cell phone records seen here. It was a calls every two or three minutes. It's as if someone didn't answer. Just call after call after call. More than 300 calls in all after Roxanne went missing. And just who is dialing up a storm on the missing girl's cell? Lewis Walls. That's right, Roxanne's own boyfriend. He started using her cell phone and making calls that obviously he would not be making with Roxanne in the room. So who is Lewis calling? The 1-800 sex lines. And another frequent number that pops up? His ex-girlfriend in New Mexico. But calling 1-800 sex lines and an ex-girlfriend isn't a crime. So Austin PD detectives keep digging and speak with the motel clerk working the night Roxanne disappeared. There was a clerk that said, yes, I did see her leave. I did see uh, him follow her. The clerk's story matches Lewis Wall's account of the night in question. He said they got into an argument that she stormed out, and he tried to uh, go after her, but she was too mad, so he stayed inside. But he wasn't alone in his motel room for long. As cops question the motel clerk further, they learn she's handling more than the books. The young lady indicated that from late that night after her shift, she had gone to the room and spent time with Lewis until the wee hours of the morning. His girlfriend, supposedly girlfriend, walks out, storms off, and all of a sudden he is intimate with another woman within it, hours. Exactly. Which leads detectives to wonder if Lewis was expecting Roxanne to return ever. Any reasonable person would say to themselves, okay, if I just got in an argument with my girlfriend, would it behoove me to bring another girl into this room right now knowing that she's going to return here at some point because all of her stuff is here? Now, police want to know, did Roxanne walk away or is there something more sinister at play? It's kind of a shotgun blast of everything. Detectives want to speak to Lewis Walls, but he's refusing to cooperate. Lewis told me several times, hey, you're, you're, you're trying to frame me. You're trying to put this on me. And I, I, No, you were the last person to see her alive. And that's what I tried to explain to Lewis. Hey, if you, if you didn't do this, help me. Help me. You know, you, 
supposedly loved Roxanne. Let's me and you make a team. Let's work together. Come help me figure out what happened. But while Lewis isn't talking, Roxanne's sisters are, and they have a frightening tale to tell. Just months before Roxanne goes missing, we were coming home, and we saw Roxanne at a bus stop. She was wearing sunglasses, so we, of course, pulled over and told her to come on in. You know, you're going home anyways. We happen to be on that side of town. And she takes off her sunglasses, and there is this completely black and white across her face. Um, she had a broken nose, and it was uh, detached, and she had to have surgery. Roxanne tells her family that she got caught in the middle of a fight between Lewis and some other men. But after Roxanne goes missing, her family discovers a darker take on the events from a couple of Roxanne's friends. Lewis did, in fact, punch her and cause that injury. But cops have no proof that Lewis attacked Roxanne. The investigation seems to be stalling. I have no probable cause right now to arrest him. Then six days after Roxanne's disappearance, a domestic disturbance call comes into Austin PD. The location, a motel next door to the one where Roxanne was last seen. It was somewhat of a perfect storm. And perhaps the perfect break cops are looking for. A security officer that happened to be walking by looked in the windows. And according to police reports, the security guard sees a man and a local stripper in the middle of a struggle. He had had her pinned to the floor and was choking her and trying to get her clothes off. The man takes off before police arrive, but he leaves some things behind. His hearing aid had fallen out uh, during the, the tussle and had left behind his wallet. Eventually, the suspected assailant returns to retrieve his belongings, now in the hands of police officers. The man is identified as Jeffrey Moore. Jeffrey Moore was somewhat of a sexual predator. He would hire uh, ladies of the night from that area and take them to hotel rooms. However, uh, Jeffrey was somewhat rough. And when police questioned Jeffrey about the alleged assault... He said, hey, no, I, I, I know that girl. Yeah, we were going to have sex, da-da-da. And the young lady, now that she is safe, has said, look, I don't, I don't want to be a part of this. Uh, she refused to cooperate. There are no charges brought against Jeffrey concerning this incident, but before cops let Jeffrey go... They were questioning Jeffrey, let me see your ID, you know, this natural routine of what the police do. ...and make a discovery that's about to rock this case to its core. Roxanne's ID fell out. Now cops have a new person of interest in their investigation, and he's not Roxanne's boyfriend. It's a game changer that's about to lead detectives to stunning new developments. Coming up... Just tell us where she's at. Two men... One of them knows what happened to my daughter. One missing girl... Kind of all had come to a head. ...in a race against time. They found a body under a bridge. But is it Roxanne? Roxanne must have dropped her ID in his car. His story sets off alarm bells with detectives. Completely contradicts the story he told the first time that she's a friend of mine, I really want to give it back to her. 